Good morning. I want to welcome you to worship, whether you're live in the room with us or watching us online. We are glad that you are here on a beautiful Sunday morning in Alabama, and uh, we look forward to what God has in store for us in this hour. Uh, I want to highlight a couple of things that are going on this Sunday and this weekend. Some of you may know this. This is Save a, uh, Save Sanctity of Life. I started to say Save a Life because that's what I'm about to introduce you. Sanctity of Life Sunday, and churches are recognizing that across the nation. And one of the ways that Mountaintop is engaged in protecting the sanctity of life is through our partnership with Save a Life Ministry. And uh, Russell Worrell, who I kept telling him, I'm going to call you Russell Wilson because I've been watching too much NFL football. Uh, th- and you look kind of Paul, you, you're great. Um, but is uh, one of our partners at Save a Life. He told me a fascinating statistic a few moments ago that when we get dads involved, and a big part of your initiative at Save a Life has been getting dads involved, 83% of women who are considering ending a pregnancy will, will keep, the preg- keep the baby uh, because there was a dad that was involved. And that's just an amazing, uh, amazing statistic. And one of the reasons we partner with uh, agencies like Save a Life. So there is an insert in your bulletin about some of the work that Save a Life is doing. And after the service is over, Russell's gonna be right outside the doors at our Compassion booth. And would love to share with Absolutely. you more about things that are going on. So thank you for being here. Thank you all welcome him to be part of Mount Talk Forum. The other thing, uh, most of you all uh, obviously are aware of this this weekend is uh, uh, Martin Luther King celebration. Tomorrow is the day that our nation sets aside to remember Dr. King. And, and this weekend, every year at Mountaintop, I, I'm just reminded that 50 years ago, back in 1963, our, our city, Birmingham, was at the epicenter of the civil rights movement. And there'll be a lot in our city over the next 12 months that are remembering and celebrating the real heroism that men and women and often kids uh, ex- uh, distribu- uh, displayed during the, the civil rights movement. And uh, Mountaintop, churches like Mountaintop could not exist today were it not for that courage that was shown. And so we will, as a nation, remember that uh, tomorrow. And I, I'm reminded uh, throughout our series, we're going to be in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And in Matthew 5, we'll look at this in a couple of weeks, but Jesus is teaching on prayer. And when he teaches his disciples to pray, part of what he says is he's, uh, he says, pray that God would make things here on earth as they are in heaven for your kingdom to come and for your will to be done here on earth as it is in heaven. And uh, things that uh, took place 50 years ago here in Birmingham were a part of helping to make that happen. And ministries like Save a Life are a part of helping to make that happen. And, uh, And the work that we are engaged in as we get off the mountain and we go out into the streets of Birmingham and around the world are part of helping make up there Uh, come down here and things here on earth as they are in heaven. And so let's open this morning with a word of prayer and give thanks to God for the ways in which that's taking place. Lord, we thank you for, uh, for the heroic men and women who are part of the civil rights movement that transformed our city and our nation and the world. We are thankful for partners like Save a Life that, that are reaching out and protecting the life of the unborn and, uh, and holding just a high value, the sanctity of life. Lord, we, we pray for your blessings upon continued efforts to bring peace and to bring justice and to save lives and that this world would continue each and every day to be just a little bit more as things are in heaven. And so as we gather here to worship you this morning, Lord, would you come, uh, would you meet us and and wherever you may find us in the places where we are, uh, would you lift us up into your presence as we worship you with one voice and with one heart this day. We ask all of that and we do it in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand and let's worship God together. I'm going to teach you a new song this morning. It's one of those songs, if you could say, that took the words right out of my mouth. Why we exist, what we're here for. So it's wordy, but I want you to catch on. I want you to sing, because this is Mountaintop's song. This is what we want, all right? Let your mercy rise. One, two, three. Let your mercy rise. Let your hope resound. Let your love in our hearts be found. Let your grace run free. Let your name bring peace. Heaven come in the here and now. Put your hands together with us. What we want. 
what we want to be. Help us, God, to be this. We want to be a church where freedom reigns. We want to be a people full of grace. We want to be a shelter where the broken find their place. We want, we want to be a refuge for the weak. We want to be a light for the world to see. We want to be a love that breaks the walls and fills the streets. Would you say this meaning? All are welcome here as we are, as we are. For our God is near every heart. Sing it out. Let your mercy rise. Let your hope resound. Let your love in our hearts be found. Yeah. Let your grace run free. Let your name bring peace. Heaven come in the here and now. We want to be a door that's open wide. We want to see compassion come to life. We want to carry truth that shines a beacon in the night. Let that be. We want to be a city filled with hope. We want to bring peace to a troubled soul. We want to tell the story of a God that we can know. Yeah. And all our welcome here as we are, as we are. For our God is near every heart. Let your mercy rise. Let your mercy rise. Let your hope resound. Let your love in our hearts be found. Let your grace run free. Let your name bring peace. Heaven come in the here and now. Sing this out. So let justice flow like a river wide. And let mercy grow like a burning fire. Let it come in the here and now. Your kingdom come till it rules the earth. Your will be done all around the world. Let it come in the here and now. All are welcome here. All are welcome here. Just believe this. All are welcome as we are, as we are, for our God is near every heart. Now you see it. Come on. Let mercy rise like it. Hope resound. Let your love in our hearts be found. Let your grace run free. Let your grace run free. Let your name bring peace. Heaven come in the here and let your mercy rise, let your hope resound, let your love in our hearts be found. Let your grace run free, let your name bring peace, heaven come in the here and now. So let justice step. Let justice roll like a river wide And let mercy grow like a burning fire Let it come in the here and now Your kingdom come till it rules the earth Your will be done all around the world Let it come in the here and now Pray this, mean this Let it come in the here and now One more time together just like this real simple teach you one more new song this morning there is power there is power here in this hour this hour we're all together together we're waiting here as one there is power. Sing that again. There is power. There's power. Here in this hour, this hour, 
we're all together, together. We are waiting here as one. Here we go. No. My soul burning in my soul. All your sons and your daughters yeah. dreaming the dreams of their fathers. That's us this morning. Seeing the signs and the wonders, the kingdom of God. Let us see the kingdom of God today. Oh, he is out from heaven. Oh, the mighty rushing wind. Oh, we're calling for revival. God, let your fire fall again. It's burning in my soul. Sin win. Yeah. Oh, 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 calling for revival. God, let your fire fall again. It's burning in my soul. This is us singing, sons and daughters. All your sons and your daughters Dreaming the dreams of their father Seeing the signs and the wonders The kingdom of God All together, church, we say This is the hour of power. Great, great day to be here. We're so glad that you're here. I'm, we value community here. I'm sure you know that Mountaintop Community Church. And you are probably surrounded by someone wonderful. So turn around and just give them a high five. If you're feeling it, give them a hug, all right?
remains one thing remains your love never fails it never gives up it never runs out on me your love never fails it never gives up it never runs out on me your love never fails it never gives up it never runs out on me your love I love you so much, and I thank you so much for the truth of the worship this morning. I thank you that you never give up on us, that you love us, that your love is eternal and it is ongoing. And in in a world where things are um, changing from day to day, God, that sometimes we just look and say, what is going on? We know that you are in control. We know that you are present with us. We know that you carry us through situations where sometimes we're having a difficult time. God, I thank you so much that you are the God who sees. You are the God who knows. You are the God who is always there. And I thank you so much that your arms are always open to us. No matter how far away we have run from you, all we have to do is turn around and we will run right back into you, God. And we thank you that when we do, you are there with arms wide open to bring us back in, God. Thank you so much that you are who you are, even when we are not. In your name I pray, amen. You can have a seat. 
My name is Mary Beth Poor. So glad to see you this morning. I am the missions pastor here at Mountaintop. I just want to take a second and tell you about something we have coming up. Um, last Sunday, I thought Doug did a great job of presenting a sermon to tell us kind of, you know, what do we do around here and, and how does it get done? And then he really had us focus on the why. And so I want to tell you about something coming up next week. Um, We have an off-the-mountain dinner and auction that's going to be happening next Sunday night in the Family Life Center at 530. And you are not going to want to miss it because we're going to be presenting all of the, um, we're going to be celebrating everything that we've done off the mountain in 2012. And then we're going to be talking about what we're going to be doing in 2013. And so how you can get involved with that is that you can buy a ticket. A ticket is only $20, and the proceeds go to mission trip participants. Or you can get a table, and a table seats eight, and it's $120. And so if you you know, know of some people who you may think uh, would like to come and sit with you at your table, it would be a great way to invite a friend to come to something at the church or maybe someone here at the church who you want to get to know better. And so you can just go to the registration booth immediately after the service and, and get your ticket um, or purchase a table. And the table proceeds are going to go to things, um, needs in various countries. And then the why. Why should you come next week? And there's two reasons that I want to give to you this morning. I think it will change your perspective. Over the last year, as I've been kind of leading the Compassion Ministry and I've been more involved in the ministries, I have seen people through short-term mission trips and then serving here locally get a different perspective. And when you serve, it helps you to take your eyes off of yourself because it's so easy if you're like me to get focused on myself But when we serve someone else, all of a sudden our perspective changes. And then the second thing that we're going to talk to you about next week and that will happen as you get more involved in serving is life change. I have seen lives change. I've seen people work together in Fairfield and they're getting to know their neighbor who lives 30 miles away. And all of a sudden they realize that even though they live different places and they have very different circumstances going on in their life, they have the same God. I've seen people go down to save a life and come alongside a woman who was going to abort her baby and chose to give the baby life. And I've seen the mentors be changed and the family be changed through that ministry. I've seen a a dad of a daughter here in the United States hold a baby in the Philippines who had no parent. And for that few minutes, he was able to give a father's love to that child. I have seen kids in Honduras be impacted when you couldn't even speak the same language, just a smile and just a communication between the two of you. And so that is what serving does for you. And at the dinner and auction, I think you're going to see why we do what we do. And also you're about to see a a video that tells a little bit of a story too about what happens on short-term mission trips. So check this out. Short-term mission trips at Mountaintop give us the chance to go into the community and build relationships with the missionaries who are already there on the ground. Just a great appreciation of how God works and how, to what extent He goes through to bring His Word to people, to bring a message to people, to provide for people. Enjoyed hearing from others about their trips, um, and I just felt like I needed to give of myself. When we arrive there, he opens our eyes to the circumstances on the ground. We go on mission trips thinking that we are going to change someone there and really you don't realize that what Jesus is going to do is change your heart. And then I think he uses that in partnership with the beautiful people who have a richness of spirit to grow his kingdom. January 27th at 5.30, and we're in a series right now called A Better Way, and if you want to get to know God better in 2013, I challenge you to serve. It will change your life. And so as our ushers are about to come, we're going to take up our tithes and offerings right now, and another way that we change is to release our resources to God and realize we don't have to depend on the things of this world, but we can give them up and trust in an eternal God. Um, who will continue to carry us through everything that we're going through. So as the ushers come, I challenge you to give with expectation and to give generously.
cannot be said a better way. It's everything you've promised. There's no greater love than me. Would you uh, pray with me? Lord, you came and you laid down your life for us out of your great love for us. Uh, what, what an amazing witness and what an amazing love. Lord, these gifts we return to you, we return with thanksgiving and we turn with love. And we pray that you take them and bless them and multiply them and use them to make that love known all around the world. And as we open your word today, Lord, uh, we want to live into this better life that you have come to bring. And and we want to handle our relationships and the conflict that sometimes occurs within them. We want to handle that in better ways. And so, Lord, teach us your truths. Open our eyes and open our hearts to the things that you would teach us. For we ask that in Christ's name, and we ask it for his glory alone. Amen. Well, as Mary Beth mentioned, we began a new series last week called A Better Way. And uh, throughout the series, we're going to be looking at a better way to live our lives. And we began last week by talking about what we do as a church. And what we do is introduce people to Jesus Christ and to his way of life. 
And we talked about how we do that in services like this or one of the ways in which we do it, our compassion ministries, the trips that we send out and when we get off the mountain here in the community and our partnership with agencies like Save a Life is part of how we, we introduce people to Jesus. And small groups is the third way. And, and I wanted to remind you again this morning, uh, last Sunday we had a small groups fair and a little over 500 of you signed up to be part of a small group this winter and spring. But small groups don't kick off for, a, I think, about another week. And so it is not too late to register for a small group. And you can do that this morning. There's information out at the guest services desk. And if you're watching us online, it's very easy to register online. Uh, Just go to the tab that says small groups and you'll see a whole list of the groups that are going to be offered this year. And you can register online to be a part of one. And, And being part of a small group is just a critical way in which we learn this better way of life in Christ. And so I want to encourage you to do that. So we talked about what we do and we talked about how we do it. And then we spent most of our time last week talking about why we do what we do. Why? Why do we introduce people to Jesus? And, and if you were here, you, you might remember that there are two reasons that we do this. We introduce people to Jesus Christ because only Jesus offers us a way to live forever and because Jesus offers us a better way to live today. And understanding why we do what we do, it helps us uh, recognize what are our core values and what are our motives, what is it that gets us up out of bed in the morning, and it helps us to understand who we are as a church. And, And part of our vision is that for us here at Mountaintop is that we would be a community that is learning and sharing a better way to live. Say that with me. We are a community that is learning and sharing a better way to live. And so what we're going to do in this series is we are going to learn in some very practical places in our lives a better way to live so then we can share what we learn with people around us. And so in coming weeks, we're going to learn how to deal with worry and how to deal with our money. Next week, we're going to talk about how to handle the gift of sex. And some of you are disappointed because you thought that was this Sunday. And, um, but that's going to be next Sunday. And I want to say again to parents with kids, uh, next Sunday's message will be a little bit PG-13. And we just want to tell parents that ahead of time so that they can make decisions of whether or not they want their kids sitting next to them. And for some parents, they may want to have the kid downstairs. And some may say, no, you have have to sit next to me next week. You, you need to hear this. But we, parents need to make that decision on their own. But this morning, we're going to talk about a better way to handle conflict. And the truth is, all of us experience conflict in our lives. And, and we don't always handle it well. Some of us are conflict avoiders, and some of us are kind of, we over-embrace conflict, and a lot of people sort of passive-aggressively uh, uh, embrace conflict. Uh, we, we don't handle conflict very well. And so what I hope we'll do this morning is that by the time we leave here, we will have a better understanding of how to handle conflict. And I, I hope you came with that sort of expectation. And I, I was thinking about it. Some of you might be sitting here because a friend invited you to come to church today, and right now you're saying, oh, so we got something going on in our life that you think we need to talk about, and that's why you invited me this Sunday. Well, maybe. I don't know. You know, you'll have to work that out. Um, But we're going to do this message and and all of our messages are going to be grounded in a sermon that Jesus gave that is found in chapters 5, 6, and 7 of Matthew. And if you were here last week, I gave you homework and you were supposed to read chapters 5, 6, and 7 of Matthew. So for all of you who did, just raise your hand so you feel good about it. Mary Beth will give you a star, a gold star after the service. Just look her up and say, Mary Beth, I need a gold star. And if she doesn't have them, that's between you all uh, to, to work out. Uh, if you have not finished your homework assignment, I'm going to give you a week extension, okay? So between now and next Sunday, read chapters 5, 6, and 7 of Matthew. It's a sermon that Jesus gave up on a mountainside uh, where he had gone up to teach. And so scholars will refer to it as a sermon on the mount. And here at Mountaintop, we're going to look at this sermon on the mountainside over the next several weeks. And it's going to help us discover this better way to live. So go ahead and open a Bible up, if you would, to Matthew chapter 5. If if you don't have a Bible with you, you can always get one as you come in the doors, and those are just our gift to you. Take it home with you. If you're watching us online, there's a little tab you can click there. But uh, find Matthew chapter 5, and what you see throughout this, this sermon is that Jesus uses a pattern for teaching where he will say something along the lines of, you have heard it said, and that's the old way of thinking. 
And then he will follow that up by saying, but I say to you, and, and now here's a better way to think. Here, here's a better, better way to live. So in, in chapter 5, here, here's what Jesus says about conflict and about anger. Um, follow, follow along with this with me, beginning down in, in verse 21. Jesus says, you have heard it said to the people long ago, do not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. And again, anyone who says to his brother, Raka, is answerable to the Sanhedrin. Just kind of pause there for for a moment. Raka is an Aramaic word, and it means you worthless nothing. And uh, so you you might need to use that later. I don't know. That's uh, but just that you would know that. it goes on, but anyone uh, who says you fool, and the, the word that was used here uh, was even stronger than the word raka, uh, is in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, now here comes a better way. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. Now, again, all of us are going to experience conflict in our lives, it, whether you're following Jesus Christ or, or not. Uh, everyone experiences conflict in, in our relationships. It's just a part of life. Kim and I discovered that not long after we were married. And we also discovered that we will often approach conflict in very different ways. Um, I grew up in a family that avoided conflict. We were just kind of classic conflict avoiders. If something was going on, you know, in the family, we would just pretend that everything's fine and everything is good and, and we could avoid we could avoid anything. I got very good at this. Um, one author refers to this kind of behavior as being a turtle. When a turtle experiences conflict, what do they do? They hide in their shell. And I grew up in a family that we, whenever there's conflict within the family, we would all hide in our shells. And the author goes on and says there are all kind of animal analogies for how we deal with conflict. Some people are like chameleons. And when a chameleon senses conflict, they just change and adapt to fit the situation. And they will avoid the conflict that way. Uh, And some people are like owls. And if you ever get in a fight with an owl, an owl will say something along the lines of, you know, let's not talk about how we feel. Let's focus on the facts. Owls like to intellectualize everything. Um, Some people are like skunks. And skunks just like to spray a little something at you when, uh, when they get confronted. Uh, usually it's a little bit of sarcasm, and they'll just kind of spray it your way. And, and some people become kind of combinations. I have a family member who's actually a skirtle. Uh, they like to spray a little sarcasm at you and then run, go hide in their shell real, real quick before you can retaliate. Um, and then some people are gorillas. And when Kim and I were newlyweds, and the, the first time we ever, ever got into a real argument, I discovered that this turtle had married a gorilla. <laughs> and gorillas, they don't mind conflict at all. And, and Kim grew up in a family that's actually very, very healthy, but they like to get conflict and put it out in the open and just kind of deal with it and talk about it. And I remember the first time I would visit them, I thought, is this recreational for them? I mean, you know, it's just like they're having fun having, a, you know, this sort of thing. I want to go hide in my shell some, somewhere. And, uh, and so the first time that, you know, we're newlyweds and the first time we had any kind of conflict, and it's interesting, uh, we've been married 28 years now. We have no idea what we were fighting about, we, but we've taught on this uh, over the years and we can still remember how we responded to, to the argument. Uh, we are having a discussion um, in the kitchen, and I reached a point where I just had enough, and so I left. And I was just a turtle. I went to our bedroom, and I turned off the lights, and I got in bed. Left Kim just standing there in the middle of the kitchen, you know, all by herself. Gorillas don't like that. And so she followed me into the bedroom and flipped on the light and announced in a very gorilla voice, um, we're not done yet. <laughs> now, I, look, I, go, I have generations of turtles in, in my family. I mean, I, I'm a southerner. We call the Civil War a recent unpleasantness between the states, you know. Uh, I, I, she flips on the lights and announced, we're not done yet. What do I do? I roll over, pull up the blanket, put the pillow over my head, Right? <laughs> get in my shell, which I discovered is an invitation to a gorilla to spring into action. 
Because the next thing I know, she has pulled the pillow off of my head and she is beating me with it. And uh, at that point, I think we both just started laughing. And, and I, honestly, we really can't remember what we were arguing about. But, it was, um, but we discovered we had these very different styles of, of how we would a- address conflict. And, and, and we all do. Uh, but, but the truth is, and we've gotten better over 28 years. We've gotten actually pretty good, and I've learned not to stay in my shell. And we, we've, gotten very, we've actually gotten pretty good at being able to handle these things. And, and I have learned never to refer to my wife as a gorilla, except when I use this illustration. And, um, and that's, that's the only time I'm allowed to. But, uh, but, but conflict's just a part of life. We still have conflict. Every, every marriage, every relationship does. And one of the things I love about Scripture is that Jesus recognizes that that's going to be the case even between us and the family of God. We're going to experience conflict. And so he gives some very practical advice about what to do when that conflict occurs. Flip over, if you would, so have your Bible open, flip over a few chapters to Matthew 18. Matthew 18, and just one verse here, verse 15, Matthew 18, 15. Jesus gives us a pattern for what to do when we experience conflict that keeps us from being conflict avoiders or being passive aggressive or, or being overly, you know, confrontive. He, he gives us this great pattern for a better way to deal with conflicts. Just one verse. And so I, I want you to read this with me and, and read it out of your Bible or, or it's going to be here on the screens. And let's read this together aloud. Jesus says, if your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have won your brother over. Now, I want, I want to unpack this, this verse and, and keep it open in front of you because we're going to just kind of walk through it piece by piece. And in this verse, we are given five decisions to make. And I like to think of them as five crossroads that we come to anytime we experience conflict. And the decision we make at each crossroad will determine whether we deal with the conflict in a, in a healthy kind of way. Uh, the, the first decision we have to make with this, anytime we experience conflict, we have to decide whether we will say nothing or whether we will go. Look how the verse begins. If your brother sins against you, what do you do? Go. Who goes? You go. Now, it's, it's, it's very clear the way Jesus has laid this out. Your brother or your sister, uh, someone, your spouse or a parent or a child or a coworker, someone has sinned against you. They're at fault. They're the one responsible. They're the one who has created the conflict, created the pain. Uh, they're the one at fault. And a lot of times what we do is we say, well, well, they caused this. They need to come to me, right? But Jesus says, No. If someone has hurt you, you have the responsibility to go to them. You need to be the one that will go and seek to resolve the conflict. You see, here, and this is just a a, a fact of life. Every time we avoid conflict, something inside us dies just a little bit, and we become a little less than who we are. But every time, and in a healthy kind of way, and we'll we'll keep going through this, in a healthy way that we confront a, a, a tough situation, that we deal with conflict openly and honestly, something inside us grows and we become a better person. And so Jesus says, if there is conflict in a relationship, even if you aren't the one who caused it, you have the responsibility to go. And so that's the first decision you have to make. Will you say nothing, just let it kind of go, or will you go? Now, if you decide to go, you come to a second decision, a second crossroad. Will you go to someone else, or will you go to the person, the person that you're in conflict with? And um, again, look at, look at uh, Matthew 15, uh, 18, 15. If your brother sins against you, go and show who? And show him. Now, we get this wrong a lot. Because we have a tendency to go and show someone else what this person did to me. And, and sometimes as, as Christians, we will try to spiritualize it and we will say it, well, I'm just sharing a prayer concern, you know, with, with, my, with my friends or with, with my small group. And, and I see this happen a lot. 
that, that people take a conflict, a relationship that they have and they're experiencing conflict and they go and they tell everyone else. Uh, to use the example, when Kim and I are having that argument, um, Kim made the right decision to go follow me in, into the bedroom. She could have decided to go call her mom or to go call a friend. And a lot of us are, can fall to that sort of temptation and we find ourselves in conflict and we decide to go, but we just go to someone else and, and we, we talk about what's going on with the person we're in conflict with. And I'll just tell you, the Bible calls that gossip. And it is a sin that is as great as any other sin that gets listed in the scripture. It shows up in the same sort of list of all the sins that we can get so worked up over as a church sometimes. And, and this is a real temptation for us. And, and again, we kind of clean it up and we'll just call it sharing prayer request. Um, but, but the challenge here is at this crossroad to, to make the decision that, that when there's conflict in the, the uh, relationship, that not only will I go, that I will go directly to the person that I'm experiencing the conflict with. And if you do that, then you have to make a third decision. And, and it's this one. Will you dance around the issue or will you tell the truth? Uh, Matthew uh, 18, 15 again. If your brother sins against you, go and show him what? Show him his fault. To go and, and very openly and honestly and humbly, um, but, but honestly speak the truth in love and, and say, here's the pain that this has caused. This is the hurt. This has affected me. Uh, and feelings do matter to say that this is how I feel about this. And, and here's what's taken place. And a lot of times we have this temptation when someone has hurt us to, to just kind of brush it off. And, and we'll say things. And, and I, I grew up doing this. And it's still a temptation for me. And someone will hurt me. And, and I'll just say, oh, don't worry about it. It doesn't matter. And I'm fine. Everything's okay. The truth is I'm not okay. And I'm not fine. And it does matter. And so what we want to do here at this crossroad is, is we've made the decision to go and we go directly to the person. Now, will we speak the truth to them? Will we humbly but honestly say, here's what's going on in our relationship. And I don't want to dance around the issue and I don't want to try to clean it up. This hurts. And, and I need to let you know, let you know that it hurts. Uh, if we'll do that and, and we'll, we'll decide to make that decision, then we have to decide uh, whether we will take pot shots in a group or whether we will resolve this conflict in private. Jesus says, if your brother sins against you, go show him his fault. Just between who? Just between the two of you. Your small group is not the setting to bring up the conflict that you may be experiencing with someone. The family dinner table over Christmas is not the, the moment that you want to bring up. Uh, the goal here is to find a time where you do this in private. But between the two of you. A little bit later in the passage, Jesus will, will give some wisdom that if you can't resolve it, here are some alternatives for bringing other people into the con conversation. But that's only as a last resort. The, the, first, uh, the first goal is to do this privately, just between the two of you. And, and if you'll do that, it brings you to a, a last crossroads, a last decision. Will you decide to remain separated or to seek reconciliation? Jesus says, if your brother sins against you, go show him his fault just between the two of you. If he listens to you, what will happen? You have won your brother over. Uh, you go with the goal of, of reconciliation, uh, with a humble spirit, but uh, with a desire to put things back together, to, to have your brother won over and, and the conflict resolved. And, and if we follow these steps, and we can resolve most of the conflict in our lives. I'll give you kind of a silly example, a light example of, of how I experienced this on one occasion. Uh, when our daughters were growing up, they, a couple of them loved to play basketball. And one of my ways of staying involved in their lives was to coach their basketball teams. And, uh, and I love coaching basketball, so it was a lot of fun for me and uh, a great chance to spend time with them. And one year, we had a really good team. And we were making our way pretty deep into the, uh, the playoffs for a, a city championship. And I remember on one occasion, we got into a game that went into double overtime, deep in the playoffs. The game goes into double overtime. Very tense situation. And at the end of the first overtime, the referee made a call that to this day, I will tell you, was the wrong call. And my reaction to that call was... Um, Matthew said that you sinned against your, I sinned against my brother. 
uh, when he made that call. And I sinned against my brother in a very public, very loud way in front of an entire gymnasium full of parents. Um, and uh, very vocally. And uh, the other coach called timeout. And I'll never forget what the ref did. Uh, I found out later, uh, as follower of Christ. Uh, he came over to me. He came to me. I'm the one who's at fault here. But he came over to me. And privately, just between the two of us, um, he didn't turn to the, the, all the parents in the stands and say, Raka, what an idiot. Um, <laughs> It just quietly, between the two of us, he showed me my fault. We might still disagree on his interpretation of the call. Uh, but he showed me my fault uh, just between the two of us. Didn't take pot shots in a group. Didn't go to the other ref and say, you know, look, look at this guy. Um, and, and he restored our relationship. And, and it's just such a simple little thing that he, he did in, in just a couple of moments. Now, the relationships in your life, I, I know that's kind of a light example. And I know that a lot of the conflict that we experience in our lives is a whole lot messier, a whole lot more complicated than me and a referee in a middle school basketball game. I, I get that. Some of you are experiencing conflict in a marriage right now, and, and you might be wondering if you're going to be able to hold it together because it's gotten really, really tough. And, and some of you, maybe are, it's conflict with an, another family relationship, and it's a parent, or it's a child, or, or a brother, or a sister, and, and, uh, and maybe you haven't spoken in years, and, and things have just broken completely apart. Or maybe it's with a neighbor, or a friend, or, or somebody at work, and, and it's just a messy, messy situation. I, I want to challenge you this morning. You can still put these principles into practice. And, and it's possible for you to, to take the first step and restore that relationship and resolve that conflict. Now, I want to throw a quick caveat in, in here for a moment. Uh, sometimes we experience conflict in relationships in such a way that it would be completely inappropriate or even dangerous for us to go and try to resolve that conflict. And, and maybe there was abuse that took place somewhere along the way or, or just the nature of the brokenness would make it very inappropriate for you just to suddenly show up at somebody's store. And, and sometimes, sometimes uh, the person we're in conflict with passes away and, and they're dead and we can't phys physically go to them. And so that happens in our lives. And when that happens, we just need to, to come to God and to bring it and lay it down before him and ask him to help us resolve it in our own hearts. And so I, I, want to throw, I, I don't want anyone to take what I'm about to say and put yourself in any kind of dangerous or inappropriate situation. And, and if, if you need counsel to know whether or not it's the right thing, find me or, or, or someone that we, you pray with after the service and, and be able to talk with them about that. But for most of us, for most of us, the conflict that exists in our lives, in our relationships, it can be resolved if we'll put Jesus' principles into practice. And, and we'll quit just being conflict avoiders and, and trying to ignore it all the time or, or deal with it passive aggressively or, or just aggressive aggressively. Uh, if we will put Jesus' principles into practice, we can resolve the conflict in our lives. And it is so important to Jesus that we would do this. Uh, flip back to chapter 5 just for a moment, back, back into the Sermon on the Mount. And, and look again at the, the passage that we read a moment ago. Down in verse 23, Jesus says, If you are offering your gift at the altar, so you're in worship. So if you're in worship and you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. In our day, nobody thinks twice about getting up and walking out of a service. I mean, that, that's, it happens every Sunday. But in Jesus' day, the, the rules that governed worship were, were so strict, so, so rigid, no one would have dreamed of getting up when you had brought your gift to the altar and, and leaving. I mean, you just didn't do that. But Jesus says resolving conflict is such an important thing that if you're in the middle of a worship service and it just suddenly comes to your mind, hey, wait, I, I've got conflict with somebody, you need to go take care of that before you do anything else. It's just that important to him. And so we need to get this right. And the chances are for some of you, maybe not all of you, but for some of you, as we've been talking about this, 
there's somebody's face that comes to mind. Somebody in your life, maybe it's a spouse, maybe it's a child or a parent or a friend or maybe it's a family member. But somebody's face has come to mind as we've been talking about this. You ought to not wait for me to finish this message. You ought to get up and go right now. I mean, don't, don't wait till tomorrow. Don't, don't put it off. Call them up this afternoon. Tell them you need to get together. Make, make an effort. It's your responsibility to go to them to resolve this conflict. It's a better way. It's a better way than, than carrying it around with us because when we carry it around with us, it robs us of the life that Jesus came to bring. And so he says, you got to go deal with this. Go, go deal with it right now. I was teaching on this subject a, a few years ago, and uh, I had a line of people at the door who had conflict with me that they suddenly wanted to resolve after the church service. Let mine wait till tomorrow, if you would. Um, you know, Sunday's kind of rough for me, but, it's, uh, uh, but, but don't wait. I mean, don't wait. This is just so important. You just need to deal with it. And, and when you do, um, and this is what's so beautiful about this, and I'm convinced this is why this is so important for Jesus. Because when we resolve our conflict with one another, we are given a glimpse of the way in which God has resolved his conflict with us. You see, we're in conflict with God because of the sin in our life and the, and the sin in the world. We, you and, you and I, and, and all of creation, we live in this conflict with God. And the good news is God didn't wait for us to come to him and say, we need to do something about this. In Jesus Christ, because there was this conflict that existed, God came to us and he laid his life down for you and for me because showing us love that way, it was a better way. And he resolved the conflict between creation and heaven, between, between you and I and God. And, and that same power is available to resolve the conflict in, in our own lives. And so the band's going to come back out in a moment, and, and we're going to sing a couple songs together. And the songs are, are great reminders of the ways in which God has restored his relationship with us, the way he resolved his conflict with us. And, and as we sing, if, if there's a face, if there's a name that has been coming to your mind uh, throughout this message, I want to encourage you to, to kind of use this as a time to, to surrender the, the pain and the hurt and whatever you have been carrying around and, and to make a commitment as we sing that you're going to resolve this conflict in your life because doing so is a better way to live. So would you pray with me? Lord, you know the names and the faces that that come to some of our minds as we talk about conflict. And you know the ways that we've been hurt and the, the pains that we carry around with us. Lord, we know that you want to free us from that And one of the ways in which you will free us is as we take that step, that step that that you'll you'll go with us to take, that step to resolve conflict, to go and to seek out our brothers and seek out our sisters and be able to put your truths into practice in our lives. And so, Lord, for marriages that that are part of this community, for, for broken friendships, for strained relationships between family members, for all those places that, that we experience conflict, uh, Lord, we want to surrender all of them over to you. And we want to pray that your power would, would be at work and that you would be restoring relationships so that together we might take hold of this life that you came to bring us. Help us to deal with conflict in healthy, God-honoring ways because that's such a better way than the way that we've been living. And we pray that in Christ's name. Amen.
get our righteousness, our hope, our peace. This is all my hope and peace. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as I want to invite you this morning, if uh, you came in here and maybe you're carrying burdens with you that you need to surrender today, and, and you'd like someone to pray over you or to pray with you as you do that, uh, we've got a prayer team that will be here over in the prayer corner as soon as the service is over, and there are people there who would love to lift up those prayers with you. And as you go out from here, and, and maybe today you need to go and resolve conflict with someone, uh, I want you to remember that you never leave here alone, but our living Lord Jesus Christ, He goes with you. May he go above you to watch over you, behind you to encourage you, beside you to befriend you, within you to give you peace, and before you to show you his way, now and forevermore. Amen. I surrender all. I surrender Oh, to thee, my blessing.